Hello, welcome to my podcast. I'm your host, Larry Liu, and today I'm joined by Peter Curry, a friend from community college days. So welcome to the podcast. Hey. So uh, you, you were just talking about your record that you were producing, and I can see that in the background you have a bunch of guitars that are hanging up there. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about uh, your uh, foray into the world of music production. Yeah, well... It's, I, it's probably it sounds bigger than it is, but um, if I panned around the room, it looks like it looks like a music store that somebody dropped a bomb in because uh, there's, there's stuff all over the place in, in the room I'm in right now. Um, so that said, um, I did a home productions recording uh, where it basically recorded in this room, you know, most of it. And um, and it was we used a computer program. We used something called cakewalk you're probably familiar with that or you've heard of it no okay well it's no, it's one of those no, no, online no. recording uh, type things you know it's all virtual but it looks it looks like a mixing board in front of you it's got the faders and everything but it's virtual which to me is the kiss of death I, yeah. so i have a friend who who came over helped me he did all the engineering i did all the, everything everything else all the musician all the music all the vocals man i had drums deep i set up in the living room <clears throat> just took it into a professional studio because we finished the project. And uh, this is a place where I recorded an album with another band. And um, they're, I mean, they're big time, you know, like Criss Cross and, and, and Gladys Knight and the Pips and you know, different people, you know, they, they're, they've recorded there. So, so I went up there and uh, I just finished there. They, it it kind of homogenized it a bit, a bit to me, in, to my ears. So I don't know, the jury's out on whether I like this uh, new version or not, but but it's done and uh, I'm a little poorer because of it, but uh, that's that, that's where it is. So what are your musical influences? I mean, uh, what made you inspired to produce this record? Oh, well, uh, I'll, go, I'll, I'll go with the log cabin story, you know, like, well, where were you born? Well, I was born in the log cabin. Now I'll go back to the beginning. When I was 10 years old, I remember sitting in front of the TV set watching Ed Sullivan when the Beatles came on. I was 10 years old. I remember watching it going, shit, that's what I want to do, you know? And, and that's where I first started, really the bug started getting me. And I learned drums and, and, and that's what I'm known for is being a drummer. People don't know that I can play other things. Um, so that's where, that's what spawned it, you know? Uh, but, oh, you know, I've been in many bands over the years, I've recorded uh, albums and, you know, with other, with band, uh, bands and, and all that, uh, a founding member of like three different bands, um, four different bands. But anyway, but anyway, <clears throat> so I, I've been around the block, as I said. As far as influences go, <clears throat> you can tell by my age, I'm not 28. <clears throat> so my influences are not probably uh, recognizable to you, if at all, um, although you have a pretty wide uh, range of, of uh, understanding of music and stuff. But that said, uh, you know, I grew up in my, my golden years, that is my high school years, and I, I, I'm proud of this, and I, I, I'm proud of it because I don't know how you can go through these years as your high school years and not want to be a musician. Because frankly, it's um, my, my here's my high school years, '69 through '72. I know, I know that no, they had wheels back then, really. You know, we had electricity, we had all that, but that was the years. And if you look, if you look at like classic rock, that's where everything. That's when everything was recorded from Get Back. And or you know the Beatles and because they folded in seventy, uh, Pink Floyd, everything, everything, Zeppelin, all those bands were back then. They all recorded their big, big Ace albums songs back then. Um, that was the year. So that's you know, I, like I said, I don't know how you couldn't want to be a musician after living through that, and and I did. So I uh, uh, so I became a musician. Yeah, I could only think about the song Summer of '69, and I just looked it up. It was. Released in 1985 uh, by yes, Brian well, Adams. Because it's like a remembered song. You know? I remember the summer of 69. You know, it's like, yeah, the good old days. What, what, was it like a magic time period for you? I mean, was it a good time to either get laid, be on drugs or something? Or well, what, they what said, was so exciting about it? You know, the old, I think it was Jerry Garcia. I think they attributed to him saying, uh, if, you remember the, if you remember the 70s, you probably weren't there. So it, it's that's the... <laughs> That was that was by not not largely, but that that was in the mix. 
So there was that. Uh, you know, I, I saw Hendrix. You know, I met John Lennon. I, uh, you know, uh, every just about any band that you can name that like was is that you go back to classic rock. Well, oh, man, that's hot shit. I saw them. You know, um, met Chuck Berry twice. Uh, you know, so so I was very fortunate. To, I, I'm, I feel blessed to have been born in that time. One, because of that. And two, because the economy was freaking booming. My dad had one job. He was a retired cop. He had a, he had a big ass house on Germantown Avenue in Philly. Um, he had a car. He had three kids. Put him through school. Not college, but put him through school. We weren't for want. We, we, didn't, we were poor, but we didn't know we were poor because everybody else was in the same boat. But we were comfortable by those standards. We didn't. We, it, it wasn't as as capitalistic as it is now. It wasn't all about like, buy, keep buying. Here, get the updated version, get the new, new cell phone. No, it was more like you got what you needed, you know? So you were, you were, um, you were more practical in your spendings. And, uh, and so we didn't have a whole lot. I got a toy, man. I, I think, except that I've moved a lot, I would still have those toys because I took really good care of it. When you get a toy back then, you hang on to it, man. You take care of it because you don't know when the next one's coming. So. So in that sense, you might go, oh God, that must have tough. No, it wasn't because you were forced to be creative. Like if you don't have, you create. And we didn't have uh, internet and all that stuff. So we had to use our creativity to entertain ourselves. We had to entertain ourselves first of all, let's preface it that way. We didn't have like a machine to entertain us. We had to entertain ourselves. And, and that also lends to the musicianship thing because that's what, that's what musicians do, they entertain. So I already had that under my belt, that sense of entertaining people because I, I did it myself just to you know, get by. So uh, it was different times. I, I, I very much like the way how you set up the connection between mu music and the economy because, um, I mean, isn't it the case that you need to have uh, some level of economic surplus or economic well-being such that, you know, the, the kids could go off and you know they could uh you know i guess do do drugs or they could experiment with music um uh be, before they you know grow up uh by you know working uh a, a job um and it seems to me that in today's world you know we're not you know giving young people that kind of uh freedom to experiment anymore um because you know you mentioned housing i mean housing is more expensive than it was before you had you know many years of salaries in order to purchase the house um you want to go to college uh, because that's the requirement entry ticket to the middle class but uh, uh but that's also incredibly expensive and laden well, with generally speaking larry when you decide to become a musician you take the vow of poverty. <laughs> it's like being a priest. I mean, because you know, it, it's not a moneymaker unless you become Bruce Springsteen. You're not going to make a lot of money. You don't do it for the money. It's a passion, you know? So that said, I think there's too many lives floating around right now. A lot of people I talk to, as, as an example, I've, I've been to parties where people, they, they, people comes up to your party, they go, hey, how you doing? What's your name? Oh, my name's Pete. Hi, how you doing? Well, oh, my name is this. What do you do? Now, I always felt that suspect anyway. What are you sizing me up to see if I'm worth you know, I'm worth it, worthy for you to listen to, or you know, but also um, I don't think it's that important. So I I've come back, I've and I've done this. I've come back and said, well, ah, it doesn't really matter what I do. What's your passions? And I swear to God, Larry, people go, huh! and you see them receding into the woodwork because I don't think a lot of people have passions anymore. Uh, not like 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 that, not like music or, you know, I mean, things that you would do if nobody paid you to do it. And that's why I, I use music as an example. Um, now that said, you, you look at a band like Pink Floyd, those guys were pretty affluent. They're all, they went through, you know, they had money. Uh, uh, Queen, you know, not all these guys, they came from money. Well, they came from money and the reason I gave you a, a good- Oh, you mean middle thing. class uh, to some extent. I mean, they were maybe not the wealthiest, uh... Well, a lot of them were, were okay, pretty well. And also, like I said, they grew up in the times when a dollar stretched a lot better. You know, when college, yes, yeah. you, could, you could literally take a summer job and pay off your tuition for that, for that semester. Think about that. 
<laughs> you, so you, 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 you that was a realistic, you know, that was real. That's what you, I mean, that's why you get these old times. Ah, oh, Christ, I put myself through school. Say, so, yeah, dude, you know, it was a little different back then. Remember? So, well, it used to be a lot cheaper. I mean, that's, well, that's, and you, the dollar just did a lot more, you know, it's not so much that it was cheaper as much as a dollar stretched more, you know, you could get more things, you know, and um, so, you know, like I said, you, you take a bit of valid poverty when you become a musician, but um, a lot of people don't get into it because now, especially it's, it's, it poses a problem because peer pressure and parents, and, and it's always been the case, get a real job. No, you're not going to do that. That's stupid. You're not going to make, go out, you know, go to, go to school and do this, do that. And it's like, but this is what I love to do. So it's discouraged. Yeah, um, I, I saw Billy Joel interview somewhere where he said that if you, or a musician and uh, you happen to be able to you know buy food uh, keep the fridge stocked uh, uh, then you have made it so i mean you know he didn't even have these grand ambitions of uh, you know yeah. multi-million dollar and, and he had to prostitute himself too i i, I, met, I read an interview with him and he said that uh, i think it was like the first five years or something like that or six years he had no control at all of his material he had to do whatever they said nah if you like god i don't do it that way you gotta do it this way these producers and these wax who don't really know what they're doing but nah that won't sell do this way. it wasn't until he got really established and you know i guess the the stranger or something you know maybe by that era that he was able to take control of his own music and do it his way so um that it's a, it's a, it's a sucky business i mean it's i wouldn't recommend it to anybody if they're looking for something that's going to sustain them first of all I, I, most musicians especially well i i'm privy to a lot of jazz guys you know i've worked with a lot of jazz guys um because i was in a band called the blues philly philadelphia blues messengers and uh, uh one of the guys in the band was like a, an old sax player from back in the day who uh, was a big name and so he introduced us to the jazz jazz community so i knew a lot of, i know a lot of jazz guys and these guys on uh, hands down, in my opinion, the best musicians in the world are the jazz musicians. I mean, because they have that, they have the skill set and the technique of a classical musician, but they can improvise. Classical musicians can't do that. So, you know, and they're they kind of think on a different planet or a different level or something, because the jazz is weird, you know. So it, it's very intricate, very uh, you know, it, it takes a lot of thought and you know and skill. So they're the cream of the crop. Now, I know these guys, and especially during this COVID thing, these guys are starving. They always are. But now they're really starving because jazz doesn't have much of a, uh, it's not a very backed genre. You know, you don't make a lot of money in jazz or blues, but especially jazz. And um, so they were just kind of scraping along. anyway. These guys are the gods of music. You know, so that's why I say, if you, if you go into music, think, ah, but I know, I'll go into music, make a million dollars. Yeah. Give it up. You're going to be very disappointed. No expectations, no disappointments. You're setting a bad expectation if you go there that way. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, so jazz is a big field. Obviously, uh, I was flipping through the memoirs uh, of uh, Miles Davis, uh, one of the, <clears throat> the great uh, jazz players in the past. Um, and, and he was uh, the pinnacle. So to use him as an example, that's like saying, oh, what about the Beatles? <laughs> you know? What about the Beatles? I said, yeah, I mean, um, and so my favorite musician, and we've talked about it in conversations several times, is Nile Rogers, uh, the, the funk artist. And um, when he was, uh, I guess, still a teenager, he was you know, in the streets in uh, New York City um, learning his craft. He was, um, you know, playing, performing in uh, various bands and um and he actually had an encounter with uh, Miles Davis, uh, and he was saying something like, um, "the the essence of, um, I guess, funk music." That that was the thing that he was learning. Um, you know, a jazz musician, funk. interestingly, uh, is uh, you know, it's 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 not what you hear; it's what you don't hear, right? Um, because 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 I guess the idea is. You know, you're not supposed to strum uh, all of the six notes at the same time. I mean, you're supposed to only hit three at a time. I guess, I think. That, that observation has been attributed to many musicians, Miles Davis being one of them. Um, 
I just I just spoke about this. I'm trying to think who the other guys were, but it's like big guns. They all say the same thing. Count Basie, I think, is one of them. Um, they said the music is the spaces between the notes. That's in essence what they said. Um, because, and you know, that's why you know you get these guys. They play guitar. It's like shut up. Like that's not that's not music. I mean, it's gymnastics. You know, it's it's impressive, but it's it. What does it do? It doesn't take you anywhere. You just kind of go, oh, that's impressive. So drum solos. I never did drum solos for the same reason. It's like, but why? I'm a support instrument. You know, uh, drums should be felt, not heard. You know, you don't go, oh, listen to the drum. You got to go, oh, that sounds great. Yeah, the drummer's tight. That's the their, that's their job. You're the support guy. You're the guy who throws the light. The guy goes down for the layup. You throw the ball, put it up by the basket, and he, he dunks it. He gets all the glory. Well, the guy who fed it to him is me as a drummer. They, those people are important, too. I mean, you, you need to, they're you know, usually important, yeah. but they're also usually overlooked. As and, and, I, and really, frankly, as well, I, I, I'd like to say maybe the you know, Phil Collins would be the major exception. I mean, I, I saw like a few months ago where he was um, he said he was giving his last concert uh, because he's already in his early 70s. Um, you know, his, he had some, you know, his back young, surgery uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's very tough for him to stand up. So actually he he was sitting down. Uh, and 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 singing his concerts. I saw that. I saw that. Yeah, it, it looked kind of sad. <laughs> but, but, but but Phil Collins' career. I mean, he started out as a as a drummer, right? I mean, um, and he was the band in Je- Genesis, I think. And uh, well, Pete Gabriel was the lead singer. Pete Gabriel was the lead singer. By but, the way, the best thing to come out of Genesis, in my opinion, is Pete Gabriel. Pete Gabriel, yeah. hands down. Yes. Way, way past Rutherford. Sledgehammer, I guess. Or, yeah. or Phil Collins. Pete Gabriel. He's the man. He, he's done some shit, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's impressive. I mean, what was the backstory behind uh, him leaving Genesis? Um, I don't know. I think he just wanted to embark on a solo thing. Or I don't know. I don't know if it was infighting. I, I know the friends now. You know, it's like sometimes there's... It's, it's, being in a band is very much like getting married uh, you know the the because you spend so much marriage. time together right well yes and the, the failure think about it the failure rate for marriage is like 50 percent you know at best well now let's times that let's look at that ratio and then times it by let's phone five people to get married to yeah the you know the odds are going to be way against you to keep that together because there's five different personalities and let's make each one of those people that you're marrying those five people strong egos Good freaking luck. So when a band stays together any length of time, it's very special. It's it's rare. It's hard. Um, and you know that's why many careers are meteoric and they're they're kind of it's sort of like professional sports. If you're around for five years, you're hot shit. You're like you're almost getting the, the old guy. And it's now music has changed because the boomers have kept the old guys going. But but really, um, it's a very short career and it's. It's a very long shot trying to get it or anywhere in it, you know. And I've done a lot of stuff. I mean, I I played uh, I played with the Philadelphia. Uh, what is it called? The um, West Oak Lane Jazz Festival in Philadelphia. It's a, it was an open air festival jazz, and I played that four years. And I played with War. I played with uh, I can't remember the bands now. But if I named them, you'd go, oh really? You know, and. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, it's, um, it, but so even so, I, I played in France, I played in, in, in Nice and Monaco. I, I was, I'm on three albums with the blues messengers. I, I put out my own stuff. I've been on the radio and you know what? That's why I'm independently wealthy today. <laughs> <laughs> so just, uh, just as a side note, I mean, I think you, you, uh, you have a, a normal job as well, right? Uh, and, well, because and you different. have to have, a, 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 in, in 99% of the cases, as a musician, you got to have a, a regular gig, regular job to support your habit. I see. Uh, being music. So, and and uh, it's very rare. I have a friend who managed to make a career out of it. it you know, that's all he did. And he did okay. He's done okay. You know, he's done, you know, not bad. Uh, but he does everything. I mean, he plays everything. He he'll play with anybody, you know. Um, so he 
gets with other bands or whatever, you know. He also uh, does nursing homes. He'll, he'll do anything, you know, uh, and just to keep the money coming in in one form or another. So you got to be a real hustler to make it in, in music. I'm a real hustler, you know, real hustling business person. It's not easy. I, I, so it's only in rare cases that, you know, you get, you know, a big contract. Oh, my God. I guess you have a better chance making it in the NBA, I think, you know. Yeah, so, so uh, not, not a lot of Lady Gagas and uh, Katy Perry's and Justin yeah. Bieber's and so forth. I mean, these are the exceptions. They the are the of rare exceptions. And uh, you can attribute that to skill or you can attribute it to right place at right time or you can attribute it to, uh, you know, a pro their product, you know, and whatever, you, you know, however you want to look at that is very few. Uh, there's this old, there's this old kind of line, joke, jokey line that goes around that says, uh, what do you call somebody who drives around in a two hundred dollar car, um, has a thousand with a thousand dollars worth of equipment in it, and they'll drive four hundred miles to, to get to do a job and get fifty bucks? Oh, you call him a musician, and uh, you know, <laughs> and that's really so. It's not it's not a winning proposition here, and you know, it, it's it doesn't even work. It really is totally a logical thing to do. I mean, I mean, what makes it really tough, I think, is the internet economy. Because I mean, on the one hand, you could say, you know, anybody can, you know, put up the recordings on YouTube and SoundCloud. Um, so you know, so you don't actually have to, you know, negotiate with the record labels if you didn't want to. But then, um, you know, there's also this issue that everybody only has a certain amount of time budget. Um, you know, even, even I, you know, like to listen to music, but I can only listen to so much uh, music. Um, and uh, and then on on YouTube or on Spotify, I mean, there's certain like playlists that I would gravitate towards. Um, and uh, and I'm sure with a lot of people, right? Um, and and I don't know what happens is that you can have a few stars that can have you know hundreds of millions of views. Um, and then you basically exhausted the, the the time budget, so you cannot actually pay attention to the smaller musicians. Um, These are my real glasses. These are just dollar store reading glasses. So I put on my real glasses. Um, yeah. Well, you know, when you talk about the internet and you and people go, well, you know, you know, you, uh, now you don't even have to have a record company, and you can do it online. Yeah. And everybody is. So the competition is even worse than it was. Um, and, and trying to be trying to get notoriety is even harder because do, do, do you ever see the, the names of bands now are like, go down two blocks, make a left. And there's a Wawa. That's the name of the band. You know, and why do they, why do they have these goofy ass, long ass names? It's because all the other names have been used up because of the Internet. Everybody's putting shit out on the Internet, calling themselves a band and names are all taken once they're taken. So you can't do that. Come up, if, you, if you make it big, people will come back at you and they'll sue you. And so you got to come up with these asinine names that are lengthy just to be, uh, just to differentiate. And um, so, like I said, the, the competition's always been there. The pauper existence has always been there. And if you look at old, old musicians who are that you, you know, way back, you know, all the way up to present, they've always lived kind of meager and they, they, be in the industry, and then you get out of the industry, and they'd be like these old guys, you know, like old blues guys, and then they'd be working in a in a factory or something for a while for a few years, and then and somebody go, hey, hey, you sound pretty good, and then they go back into the industry. So it was back and forth because you, it's hard to sustain yourself. You can't, you know, and and these are big guns. So I'm just a, I'm just me, you know. Yeah, I mean, but then if you think about the pioneers of the the pop music era. I mean, well, there was some indications, but maybe with Elvis Presley, the 1950s, I mean, the guy that uh, goes out uh, with these, you know, very uh, fancy dresses on stage. Um, but, uh, but I would say that the foundation of the pop music movement, in my view, was the Beatles that you mentioned. Um, and it seems to me that, you know, if you are a pioneer, if you're sort of the first one that, you know, defines and uh, stakes out the field, uh, that, you know, if everybody's sort of, everybody else is sort of uh, formulating their identity around you. you know how many right? people say, oh, Keith Richards is so good. It's like, 
he's doing everything he does is from Chuck Berry. And they go, yeah, but he does it better. And it's like, Chuck Berry freaking invented it. <laughs> I don't care how good he does it. This fucking guy invented it. You know? So give creds here, you know, like where they belong. That's what happens is, and you'll see it in the music industry. Something comes out and you've seen, I know you've seen this, a band will come out and they get hot. And there's like 20 bands, satellite bands come out just like them because it's, it's product. And I'll even take that product. I'll make money. A lot of prostitution in music, you know? And I, I never did that. And that's why, that's why I'm ind- independently wealthy today. <laughs> um, <laughs> again, I say, but really that's, uh, you know, you can make money in music, you know, get, get in a wedding band. I never did that either. So it, it well, because there's always music, weddings you know, happening, right? You have to prostitute yourself to some extent, you know, to a large extent, actually. Um, and even the Beatles did cover band stuff, you know, early on. Uh, and Stones, all those, all those everybody does. Because because nobody wants to hear your stuff. People people to listen to music you've heard a million times. It's it's comfortable because you know where the next note is, and you just sit there. You don't have to think. Like it's like watching TV. It's metal massage. Now, contrast that with a band you've never seen before doing their own stuff. You have to interact with it. Fuck, that's work. I'm not going to do that. I'm in a bar having beer. I don't, I'm trying to pick up, pick up this broad. I don't want to have to think about music. I just want that shit in the background. There you go. So that's what you're up against as, you a, to, uh, sorry, as a uh, singer songwriter guy, you know, and, and that's why this, that's why there's so much failure in that. So, so the, the contrast to, you know, pop music, which of course contains the word popular, that is to say, you know, appeal to the masses um, would be avant-garde uh, music, which I mean, of course, it's, uh, you know, there's the the French terminology, uh, which already is quite elitist. Uh, it's a kiss of death. You want to narrow your field going to avant-garde anything? <laughs> uh, uh, avant-garde, uh, but I mean, avant-garde music can be quite um, yeah, attractive, but 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 as the term suggests, I mean, you have to belong to some kind of music elite i mean the person that you are describing oh i just want to get late tonight and have the music in the background i mean Which that is, doesn't by the sound way, most, most of J- joe q very avant-garde that. they don't want to they don't want to go avant-garde they don't they don't want to do anything but brown-eyed girl you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? they yeah, want yeah. to hear shit that they've heard a gazillion times hey man could you do any stones uh no you they were out like 60 years ago weren't they it's like come on man move on also, people, I heard this once and I, I rebelled against it and all my musicians friends rebelled against me. I said, you know, it's a sad thing. Who was it? Reynolds who tried to qualify what good art is. And um, he failed, you know, and that was that was painting art, you know, from his era, the Ace of Renaissance. Was like, but um, and he could never really pin down what the criteria was for good art. Um, just as hard with music, you know, and um, so people don't even know if you're good. They don't even know if you're good. Here's the way people listen to music and, and discover you're good. <laughs> Just like everything else in the world, they have no mind of their own. That's you know, right, they can't yeah, yeah. think. Well, so, I mean, yeah. that, that's the thing. I mean, you have to be a lead yourself. So I'm going to recount one of my favorite musician encounters. Uh, not myself, but uh, just from reading and listening. Uh, it was, you know, Nile Rogers encountering David Bowie. Uh, and uh, they were at a at a bar uh, after hours club in somewhere in the UK, um, and um, uh, and you know they, they hadn't you know met in person before, um, but but when they did, they hit it off right away, and and it was interesting because Ro- Rogers, um, you Is know, Paul, Paul Rogers, and, and, and Nile, Nile Rogers, um, who Nile. The, he's uh, uh, he's uh, the, the 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 leader of Chic, uh, the band uh, oh, well, in, in the seventies. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, he also produced a lot of records. Uh, it's kind of a with, narrow cult following band too. Not with, a lot of with, chic, chic groupies out there. Yeah, I'm I'm an absolute groupie of Chic. I mean, I'm in okay. the Facebook group and I share songs there regularly. Well, that's one. You're one. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I, 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 but anyway, so but, but it was very interesting because he recounted from a story. He had this impression that they were only going to talk about pop music because at that point uh, Bowie it's you know whatever the Ziggy Pop uh, 
uh, Iggy Pop or whatever. I mean, he, I, and you know, Major Tom. I mean, he had a lot of. Sure, he was he was starting you know, to hit his stride. Yeah, I mean, he he had a lot of yeah uh, these you know popular records, and he thought you know well okay we're going to talk about pop records, but it turned out that actually they were talking about jazz music. I mean that, that that's why when you were mentioning earlier that jazz was sort of like the the, the elite of the elite of music. <laughs> I, mean, I really thought of that story. Musicians right? know that. That's why Bowie would gravitate to. That. You know, I was just at a, a friend's birthday party. His uh, he had a seventieth birthday. I've been in bands with this guy which is scary because I'm right behind him. But, um, and I, 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 half the people there, if not more, were musicians. A lot of them I played with. Uh, a lot of them I was actually in bands with. So, so you picture a, a, an auditorium with you know, you know, like a gathering for a thing in an auditorium. And most of the people there are, the music, are musicians watching musicians on stage. So uh, all night long, you know how many times we talked about music? I talked about music with a musician. You know, musicians don't just, that's, that's, you don't squeeze their head and music comes out. I mean, there's, there's other things going on. They're, they, they're observing the world like everybody else. You know, they're just people. And, and so, you know, to grab, to look at David Bowie and go, well, I've got to talk about pop music. It's the last thing he wants to fucking talk that's about. Right, you know? That's right, yeah. Uh, celebrity don't like to be celebrity sometimes. They, like, they prefer it when they're not noticed and they can yeah, and, and, and i you know a few weeks ago or so i went to the bookstore and uh, and i sometimes I go, I go by the the music uh music biography sections and um and and and, and there is a book by david bowie um where he's talking about like a hundred books that uh that he has read and uh, that have you know deeply influenced him and he sort of uh he, I, I guess he does like book reviews in this way uh, of, um, of books that influenced him. But you can see, I mean, I, the, the point really is, I mean, this guy was not just a musician, right? I mean, uh, he was a, a fully developed um, human being, intellectual, <laughs> yeah, human being and intellectual. I mean, a guy who. Oh yeah, no, this, uh, that's know, another misconception. Uh, you know, music. A lot of musicians, uh, not across the board, because you still have the guys like you know in these metal bands and stuff and even them very often are bright guys because it's not music is it's 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 mentally you, know, you have to have some acumen to do music because it, it requires a lot of thinking you know um you, you're lining and it's split second thinking a lot of times you know you got to respond in the second in the moment to something somebody over there is playing and you're not even talking to them you're not even looking at them so that's another thing it's like this this uh this sixth sense thing going on, which is nuts. And it's hard to explain to somebody who's not a musician, but it's five people communicating without talking. It's, it's wild. It's, it's, it, it, there's nothing to compare it to really. So, um, but it's, but like I said, oftentimes, look at Brian May is a freaking neuroscientist or something. He's, he's coming, you know, the guy from Queen, the guitarist, he's like, he's got, he's published papers and all sorts of shit. He's brilliant. Um, a lot of those guys are. A lot of those guys either went through art college or they or they went like him. They're engineers. They're you know even Bowie. I mean, uh, Jagger was going to be a, a lawyer, I think. So you know, it, it's it, it, the the misconception, like there are many it, with people about musicians, is that they're fucking dunderheads. They couldn't do anything else. No, they chose it, and they they knew that it was going to be a rough thing, and they chose it anyway. But the one thing you got to say about musicians. It's just that they went with their passion rather than, well, I'm going to do what's the right thing to do, you know, which is what 99% of the public does. So it's a big chance. It's a big reward if you do well, but it's a big chance. And and uh, the failure rate is bad, is big. Right. I mean, I mean, if you have to consider, I mean, yeah, it's a high risk, but then also a high reward. Because, I mean, if you think about, you know, doing like a bourgeois career, I mean, if you became... Uh, a, a doctor, lawyer, teacher, as your parents were, you know, sort of uh, employing so you to do. Um, but nobody remembers, I mean, those individuals. I mean, even though, I mean, nobody denies that, well, you know, we need doctors and, you know, well, lawyers, it's a mixed opinion. But, but you know, we need some, I guess, uh, professionals um, to have a functioning society. But... Um, but but then with music, it's like okay, it's true that you know a lot of the 
you know, street bands, you know, okay, nobody remembers them, but, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of names. I mean, that you know, we, we come across all the time. I mean, you know, Phil Collins, whatever, Elton John, uh, Madonna. I mean, there's a bunch of people that, you know, they, they define a certain space in the music world and we, uh, and we keep uh, going back to them and, and, and getting entertained by them. So you know that reminds me of is like multi multi level marketing. I don't know if you've ever encountered somebody trying to push multi level marketing on you, but they always t- turn to look at this guy. He's made a million gazillion dollars doing it. They'll pick one guy. It's like it's it'd be the equivalent of saying you should pay, take start playing basketball. Look at this guy, Michael Jordan. You're never gonna you're never gonna be Michael Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I said high risk, high reward. I well, uh, well, of course, no the, risk. The, the risk is I mean, important. That's, the, that's life. But, but the point is that um, it, it, people a lot of times go into it for the wrong reasons. Uh, one, because they think there's going to be that kind of reward, that kind of, uh, you know, I'm going to get fame and fortune. That's a foolish reason to go into anything. I think. But you, go, you go with it with love. And then you hope that money is going to come after that, but you're not expecting it, right? Well, and if the money doesn't come, you still got the love. You still have the love, exactly. And then this, that's, a, that's a pretty valuable thing, especially in this world. Something you love, fuck. <laughs> People don't love each other. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, even Rogers, I mean, he had uh, you know, a bunch of cancer surgeries recently. Um, and, um, and, and he was asked in an interview, I mean, what is the thing that he fears the most about um you know missing out on in life and he and he said uh, it's a, the ability to play guitar i mean if if he ever gets to a point where you know his hands no longer work or oh. you know Brrr. yeah exactly then then yeah. life would be over for him de facto well that's because that's your passion you take away somebody's passion it's it's pretty crippling you know any passion what about the the, the football player who now breaks his neck and he, he's in a wheelchair so he's not able are, to there's a million anymore. stories like that you know and and what do you do now and, and my life is over you know because no, but you... I, th- I, th- I think as an athlete i mean as a former athlete i mean there are still ways how to stay active right i mean you no, same, with coach, people, right? same with music same with every industry but when you're passionate about something you excel in it and and you're and it's, it's your life to, ha- to have that stripped away you think your life has been stripped away what do i have to live for and i think music more so because musicians are we're sensitive, you know, so so we're even more subject to that kind of, you know, you know, because because we're sensitive. We're, we're already kind of like teetering. I was saying to the guy who I was in the recording studio with today, I said, yeah, I said I was up here and I, I, um, I did a recording of my own with the band, but I came back in to do a, a guitar part in the middle because I thought the sax part that was played sucked. So and so I did. So I always prescribe everything prescribed in my head. I know exactly with my songs everything that's going to play here's what you play and musicians hate me for this but i went in with the knowing what i was going to play for that solo in the middle and i went in and i played it one take and the guy running the studio who's worked with big guns i, I looked at him and said glenn was that okay and he said yeah pete that was great right well i said that to the guy today and he laughed and um and i said and i followed it up i said you know the thing is musicians are an odd odd like mix of ultra ego driven maniacs who are ultra insecure at the same time so it's these two it's like makes for a story but but both of them fit together don't you think i mean well no no they don't they're constantly in conflict with each other constantly um and that's why you'll hear these stories about uh, you know like a david bowie type and then you get them aside from that and they're like oh they're very shy and they're but because that, that's like a persona. That's well, but I mean, the, the, the opposite of like an, you know, even keel, calm personality, uh, like a Zen personality would be bi- bipolar. I mean, basically you have... Uh, it, it is bipolar. Hard and cold, it, uh, it, 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 being a musician, you have to be bipolar because you're on, you're off, you're on, you're off, you're on, you're off. You have a you have a business side you have to take care of. Oh, and then I have to take care of this side. Oh, and a technical side. And, uh, uh, yeah, but that's a technical just, side. But it's, I, it's, I it's, it's, it's about but the personality thing. It's about self love. Uh, ad, you know, requiring this adulation, requiring this love. I mean, I I, I was watching um, a lot of Elton John interviews because obviously I like his music too. 
um, and, uh, and and he had very depressive phases. And in one interview in the, in the 1990s, you know, um, he was just about to to wean off uh, from his drugs. Um, and um, and he said that one of the reasons why he was able to survive uh, this depressive bout um, was because he was doing live performances. You know, yes. he was, uh, you know, because uh, people were singing along with this. you that you're, you're an okay guy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they were We constantly need on. this, Larry. This is what musicians constantly need. Yeah. Like, well, like kids or dogs or something. We have to have constant... But, but, but then he would here. describe that, you know, so after the performance, I mean, he would go back to the hotel room where he would be staying during the tour. Um, and... And and then yeah, the room would be very quiet. And I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm a very introverted personality. So I mean, after you know, uh, long conversations, you know, I, I I kind of do like it to be you know, quiet at home and sure. um, just uh, decompress. That's why we get along, by the way, Larry. Is because polar opposites, really. You know, that's and it, yeah. and we both appreciate that other side that we can't be. I, that's I, that's my belief, anyway. Yeah, yeah. And that's but, why but you and I get John, along. For Elton John, this was an absolute terror for him. I mean, being by himself, because then what would happen is, you know, there's a, you know the, the the voices in his head that uh, start to act up, and then he, you know, he he relapses back into the drugs. And um, I don't mind. Terrible. I don't mind Devil's Workshop. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and it's really true. I mean, it, it, that's when you get depressed when you're alone because you start thinking in. And what's what is depression but self but anger? turned in really so um and the hatred turned in uh, so and and when you're alone you tend to think in you know you think you get inside your own head that's why i think louis ck did a thing on it just some comedians have done a thing on it where people can't these days especially more than ever because we i grew up in an era where you had to entertain yourself all the time um because nobody else would there was nothing else there wasn't shit to plug in and turn on um so I say, especially today, not because I'm, I'm being small curmudgeon and saying, well, back in my day. But, you know, that was a different, a different era, different thing you know, back then. Um, but, you know, it's hard to do. It's hard to entertain yourself if you've never done it. And you don't see much of it anymore, I don't think. It's very rare when you see somebody. Uh, and anyway, the routine that I saw that I think Louis C.K. did, he said, you know, people immediately, if, they're, if, they're, if they start thinking in, they can't handle it. They got to pick up <laughs> because they can't be alone with themselves. That's a freaking terrible, pathetic, tragic case, the state to be in, I think. Yet, younger generation. That's most of the nation. Yeah. That's most of the nation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and I noticed, I mean, so, the, so there was this book by Sherry Turkle. Uh, it was titled Alone Together, but she studies the impacts of you know, smartphone addiction on society. Uh, and particularly among the younger generation who are the so-called digital natives because they don't know anything else but, uh, you know, using the smartphones. Mm. Um, and uh, she basically says that, um, you know, even though people are better connected than ever before because, you know, you can, you know, text anybody you want 24-7 uh, and get a response from them. But um, but genuine form of the human level interactions, you know, which requires, you know, face-to-face -face encounters, um, that's where people have become absolutely incompetent. I mean, even over here, I mean, when I try to wave at people about my age or slightly younger, um, uh, you know, they, they, they think I'm a madman, I guess, you know, because there's no reply back versus if I... They think you're weird. Yeah, if, if, if I see like an older person, like let's say about you know, your age, my parents' age, and I wave at them and then they smile and they wave back. And I was like, wow, that's... Uh... How about that? <laughs> what, is, what is this? They is this a dialogue? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there are a million, uh, compared to like when I was growing up, there's a million ways that you can communicate now. And there's probably less communication than ever. Think about that. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's because people don't, like what we're doing now, belly to belly, you know, talking, dialogues. I mean, let's face it. This is not dialogue. This is monologues thrown back and forth. That's what this is. Because <laughs> okay. when you text something, you throw it out. That's not a conversation, for God's sake. You don't see them. You can't do this. You can't. You don't see. You can't do things like that. So you don't have facial recognition and stuff uh, to to all. 
you're first of all you're cutting down the way you're communicating your your ability to communicate this is communication dialogue not monologue dialogue and and you don't see much of it anymore soft skills are i've never seen them so low in my life you know they're teaching soft skills now because kids don't have it innately we had it innately because fuck we had to but now it's it's not the necessity it was and or so it seems i think it is but it's just i've recognized as necessity anymore yeah I, I saw an interview with bernie sanders when he was still running for president and uh, and he was asked about his childhood memories i mean he grew up in flatbush uh, brooklyn new york keep talking um, i just got put on the overhead fan because i'm melting yes of course um and uh, he said that the main childhood memory that he has um, was uh, playing ball, um, I guess, you know, kickball, stickball, and whatever games they had um, back then uh, in, in the streets in, in Flatbush, New York. Um, yeah. Uh, because he said that, you know, there, there were no adults back then. So he grew up in the 1940s. Um, Larry, and- you'd leave in the morning. This is absolutely true. You've heard these stories. You'd leave in the morning. Your parents say, be home for dinner. You wouldn't see them for the rest of the day. You could be out getting raped or murdering or <laughs> they didn't know what your parents doing. wouldn't care i mean right so, well I mean, it wasn't that it's just that there was they kind of went well you're on your own and and i think it fostered a sense a, a better sense of being on your own you know like you know fending for yourself you know i, I don't think that's available to a lot of kids because there's a lot of helicopter parenting and all that shit with it it's a shame i think i think it's a terrible loss for kids um you know i was going to do i, I might my major was in college and I graduated 2018. Thank you very much. Um, but my major is early ed special ed because I think that's when you, that's when kids are pliable still. They can be molded. They can be pushed back on the track, you know? Whereas when you get above that, you're locked in your ways. Well, there's not a lot in during those molding years when we would be out on a bicycle and coming home, you know, when the street lights went on or whatever, you know, whatever you're, your thing was um we had to fend for ourselves we we, we encountered weird shit they were perverse back then too there was all sorts of crazy shit going on i used to get jumped regularly you know but, but, but you would play with the other kids in the neighborhood right so it well, is a, yeah, it's kind I of mean, a gang yeah. building right well yeah you'd go back you know i had friends in the neighborhood i'd go visit them no old ladies live back the street i'd go visit them i mean and so you get you get you get more worldly in a weird what kind of kid way because you, you learn how to communicate and you learn how to communicate with anybody. You don't talk down to people. You don't talk up to people. You talk to people, you know? And, and I think that's, that's, like I said, that's why they're teaching soft skills now because that's what it is. I work for CareerLink now. That's getting people jobs. And man, I see it all the time. These people grunt. They're monosyllabic grunting. I mean, at best, that's their communication because this is what they do. <laughs> you know? right and, and and then if they see you know you as a face-to-face person they they're shocked and surprised they're scared and, they're absolutely frightened they think you're weird i mean you, you go up and talk to a young person like, you see him going like, like <laughs> 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 i'm not shitting you and it, it's hilarious to me because it's like dude lighten up <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's just, I mean, uh, you're not dangerous. You're not going to bite them. You're no, not them but, and, but they're so un- unaccustomed to it because their friends don't do that. Their peers, that's who raises you, not parents, peers. So their peers don't do that. So they don't, they don't recognize what it is. What, do you, what is this? What are you doing? What is this? What's this communication? This is talking? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's almost that bad. It really is. Right. I mean, so, I mean, it's gotten to the stage where i mean so that, that that's why i find it very interesting i mean the podcasting revolution so to speak right uh, the stuff that i produce but uh but there's many other people also in in the business now and um uh and you know the early people like you know uh adam curry i think uh is also has the same last name as you um that's curry curry c-u-r-i-e it's french yeah. right. Very, not very, curry very as two r's and and curry's not even irish but they changed it it was c-u-r-r-y originally o curry uh when in ireland but the point is things change when you come to america so but oh, her right. name was uh, madame curie but i get that a lot it's like no no, no the wrong name look it up 
This is a different one. <laughs> Go okay. ahead. I'm okay. sorry. Yeah, you have to look at etymology. But yeah, and then, and then it was Joe Rogan, and then mm-hmm. uh, you know, like Lex Friedman, and uh, I mean, and then a, a lot of comedians. I mean, now you see podcasting everywhere, and and I and and, and I was wondering. I mean, does the podcasting revolution have something to do with what we just talked about, which is I guess the, the the craving for old school conversation, I because so you know when I listen to you know people like Joe Rogan or or others, it almost feel I mean if you're like a really good conversationalist, uh, it's almost like you know you sit in a bar, you know whatever you know you know eating your burger and drinking your beer, and, and but and, but then you're you're listening to, you know the guys in the other table talk with each other. Uh, and you find it very comforting. I mean, you, you would never sort of intervene necessarily. It's what we're meant to do. We're humans. We're interactive critters. We need, we're societal. We need other critters like us to be around us and go back and forth. It's been stripped away. What do you think that's going to do to the psyche of the, of the, of the race, of the population? Look at our population. It's deplorable. Yeah, it, it's they're, right. they're not talking. Yeah, that's They're turning right. at each other. They're fighting each other. And it's like, well, yeah, that's what happens when you don't talk. Yeah, so I, it's very interesting because obviously, I mean, since the pandemic, I mean, you know, I would say that the political temperature has gone up a lot. I mean, I mean, some of it has to do with, you know, having the wrong leaders in charge. I mean, if you have somebody, uh, you know, whose every tweet gives you a heart attack, you know, like the, the former president who, who will be unnamed now. Um, but it, I mean, I, I would think, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to be particularly helpful. Right. Um, and also you yeah, had the pandemic where I think that a lot of people were, uh, losing touch, uh, with other people. Right. Uh, and then, and then they clutch to the phones even tighter. Uh, I mean, it's gotten to the extent where, you know, if, if I go out, I mean, you know, you only see people glued to the screens, uh, oh. um, <laughs> it's an interesting thing, and I'm only saying this, bring this up because you and I were both, uh, we met through school, but we were both in the honors thing. So, you know, remember? And 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 in the honors program, uh, it was one year, first year in the community college. The it was like, a, it was like a, a renegade yeah. school. It was like, it was a whole different school, but but they taught the humanities. And and the, and Ralph Farris, who ran it, I remember him saying, uh, remarking, and I know other guys did too, but he, it was his, that was his baby. He ran with this one. He said, uh, they're constantly trying to eliminate the humanities in colleges. And we're, at this time of our development, or whatever, our nation's history, God, we're screaming to learn humanities because basically what it does is it teaches you how to communicate. It teaches you how to, you know, to be a person, to be a citizen. You know, and and uh, I was t- I don't know if it's still the case, but it, people who used to come from other countries to America. They'd send their kids there because they they had humanities in America. They taught humanities, and yet they were constantly trying to get rid of it. It's a waste. What's a? You don't need that. I'm not paying for my kid to learn. No, you should, <laughs> because you're, obviously the kid's not learning how to be a human at home. <laughs> not getting it from you. So no, they they need to go somewhere and learn it. It's like. It's like uh, context, learn that. You have to learn context. You don't, you don't just pick that up usually. You have to learn critical thinking. You can't just, oh, I got it. No, I mean, you have to kind of learn how the nuts and bolts of it. And I think, I think humanities are, uh, the need for the humanities, the need is the same need that is for soft skills, which is the same need uh, for belly to belly communication because we're, we're, we're social critters. And we've taken out, it's like taking a, a nutrient out of somebody, you take away vitamin C, it's going to be ramifications. You take away the sociability of mankind, there's going to be ramifications. And that's what we're saying. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, from the honors program, I, I thought there were like two main skills that we acquired. Um, you know, one was, you know, how do you read, you know, like 100 pages a day of, of text, uh, which <laughs> can be quite challenging and 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 then the and then the other skill was um you know this active listening um and speaking right uh, this idea that you know you couldn't say whatever you wanted uh, as in a normal college class but you actually had to respond to what your previous speaker said um and actually it was that second skill that was much harder to me because with the first skill i mean you know i 
know, I loved reading. I mean, before I came to honors. And you'd always work your ass off to do it. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, so I, I actually enjoyed the, the readings uh, element of it, but, but, uh, but the speaking, I mean, this active listening. Um, Listening's hard. Yeah. I struggle. That, yeah. That, that, that was hard for me because, um, because I'm, I'm somebody that, you know, needs time to process. Like if you say something, you know, I would like to, you know, go home, you know, sleep a night over it, think about it. And the next morning I want to give you my response. <laughs> that's a sort of uh th that's sort of my my it's fun. again, there's there's another way. one of those like that I said earlier where we're polarly opposite. I'm I'm literally ADD. I mean I've been diagnosed. So like explains a lot of my schooling up until college, <laughs> which which I didn't even go into until I was 56 years old. So, you know, uh, it took that long before I could calm down enough that I could actually do that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so, so I explain to people that they say, well, yeah, ADD, ADD. And it's like, think of it this way. Do you ever see those, do you ever see those, like at a, at a party or something, they have the glass box and it's dollar bills flying around a million and they're trying to grab things like this, like and, and they're flying know, all over people are laughing at them. That's what ADD is like. There's all these thoughts. <laughs> and you go, ah, <laughs> grab one, you go, oh, what's this? Uh, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. really, and they just, it goes out of your head. You go, oh, ah, you know, and there's constantly fleeting thoughts. And so I have a hard time listening because I'm afraid I'm going to lose the thought that is pertinent to the moment if I wait. So I, I'll blurt out. And, and it's, it's more, um, it's more a, a, a practical consideration. If I don't, I, I'll, I'll forget about it. I've moved my moved five thoughts away by now, you know. By the time I, 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 I think being a scatterbrain is 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 a normal human condition. I didn't say scatterbrain, um, but thank you for the uh, the soft uh, soft skill way you've put. That. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd say it's like sometimes. I mean, yeah, it's 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 very hard to sort of you know calm down your mind and fall asleep at night. Uh, for instance, I mean, if you're a scatterbrain, I mean, one of the things that it's a different I've, wiring. That's all. Yeah, one of the yeah. things I found very helpful. I mean, to impose some order in the disorder of the mind is uh, by just talking to yourself. I mean, out loud, like verbalize. Um, I mean, of course you do it only if you're by yourself, but uh, because, you know, if, if you wanted to formulate words through your mouth, right? I mean, there's only so many words that you can say at a time, right? Mm -hmm. while, while, you know, while, if you're silent, I mean, in, you know, the thoughts in your mind, I mean, you can have hundreds of thoughts at the same time, uh, but you can only say one word at a time. That's not true. <laughs> my mother, this is, why, this is why I tell people, this is where I got my gift of gap from my mother. My mother basically taught me how to carry on a conversation in a room for three hours by myself. So <laughs> the moral of that story is, no, I'm not for, I'm not for want of words. And I'm, and they're and they're spewing out almost endlessly. I have to I have to stop stop have to stop yeah because I just because the, like I said they're fleeting thoughts that I, I want to express and they're because they're fleeting they're going to be gone in a second so I got to say it now. Uh, yeah, so yeah. no, it, it's really a tough thing to deal with that way. It does not work in academia, but it works in entrepreneurism. It works in leadership. Um, it works in in creative type stuff, arts. It's, 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 if you look at those things, especially when you look at any of them, you'll see a lot of ADD people. It's a different type of wiring. And what do they do? They drug kids because they want to make, uh, you got to do good in school. It's like, what happens? What about our leaders? What about, what about our, our entrepreneurs? What about our artists? What about our, you know, what about all that? Where you're actually, you're thinking outside the box is what you're doing. That's what ADD is geared toward. You know? I find it very interesting, like the successful, entrepreneurs um they don't seem to want to finish college i mean like, uh, like mark zuckerberg um would be uh, you know uh, the, the microsoft founder bill gates uh the college dropouts and then there's others who you know finished college but um I don't, I don't know how important the college experience was to them i think that you know they and became entrepreneurs despite of the college credentials. Uh, I was an entrepreneur. Of... I had my own business for 20 years. And I didn't like school. And I realized rapidly that if I wanted to keep a roof over my head or wanted to eat, I had to work myself because I don't work well under the thumb. And, uh, and most academic jobs require this. Uh, you know, and I can't do that. You know, 
That's why I one of the reasons I didn't become a teacher, too much scrutiny, too much oversight. So, um, you know, so, so there you go. That's it. It's a weird thing. And it's, it's, and I think those guys, I bet they're, there's, I bet there's at least some of them that are ADT, but um, you lose interest in something that doesn't interest you, you know, and, and you see it riddle, you see it through history, all through history, people like that. So it's not just those guys. That right. Are, I mean, it's, it's an important question. I mean, what are the functions that we need in a human society? I mean, is it about preservation? Well, you're not learning it in school. <laughs> or is it about progress? Yeah. So, right. So, because, so I, th I think what school teaches you is preservation, right? So that is to say, you know, we need to have X amount of doctors, uh, X amount of uh, teachers and uh, engineers and people with certain technical skills. So that's just to preserve the kinds of tasks that uh, our society <laughs> has. Um, but it's not and, for everybody, you know. Right. But, and, but, then, but then I think... And to impose it on everybody is... We're individuals. You can't do that. Right. Exactly. Because I think there's also the creation aspect. That is to say, create something new that did not exist before, and um, and I, 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 and it seems like, you know, I, I, at least in U.S. society, I think there's, you know, we we do allow for for both um, systems to uh, both types of thinking to coexist. Uh, I mean, I was thinking. I mean, if you live in an authoritarian country, you know, like China, Russia, come to mind, but there's many others. Um, where I think the entire emphasis is about preservation and you know, of, of existing tasks. Um, and, and if you want to be the creative type, I mean, uh, then there would be like a hammer that would go above your head. Well, we have that here. It's called survival. The thing is, if, if you go the route of entrepreneurship, it's almost like being a musician, isn't it? In that, you, yeah, you're own, I'm my own boss. You know? Yeah. You know what that means? That means that but you can't when it's time something. to write something on a piece of paper, you don't just go, give me a pencil, give me some paper. You have to go, where am I going to get a pencil? I got to get some pencils. While I'm out, I'm going to have to pick a paper. Let me see that. I'll go to Staples. That's going to take, so there's all these other considerations. So it's, it's not the, 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 the romanticized vision of being by yourself that way. And, and that's what happens. So it's, it's easier, despite the fact that, it goes against, that's why so many unhappy people. So it goes against everything in you, but you know, it's still going to be easier than trying to do that where you're, you know, you have to get the pencil, you have to get a paper. That, that, that paradigm shift from employee mindset to, to employer mindset, most people can't make that, that jump. And that's why so many businesses go out fold because they can't make that paradigm shift. They can't switch from employee or employee to employer. It's a whole different set of skills that are involved, whole different. And this whole idea about, you know, leadership and uh, be, be being responsible for, you know, the design, uh, execution, uh, planning. You, got, you, go to, you go to a nine to five or you know at the end of the day, you're going to get paid. You work for yourself. You got to make that happen. You know, I, I, I told them at work, I said, you know, we're slow right now. And they said, well, that's why I don't pick up. I said, yeah, but it's killing me. I said, you got to understand, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. If you didn't produce, you didn't eat. So that's the, that's the mindset of it. Now, some people would say, that's a great work ethic. No, it's survival. I don't like working. I can sit in this room by myself with a guitar for the rest of my life. <laughs> I'd be perfectly happy. So it's not like I'm, oh, I'm a go-getter. No, it's survival. It doesn't feed you. Yeah, I, I, just, I, I like to eat and, you know. <laughs> that, but, okay, so there's an important question here, which is that because you know, we already have such a wealthy society, I mean, we could easily maintain everybody at a certain standard of living with not, not with zero work effort, but with minimal uh, work effort compared to, you know, uh, previous generations that had much less technology. Um, so, and, um, but it, I don't know, it seems to be that we still have a hard time to make it easy for people to, um, yeah, seek out these alternative paths. I mean, now, you know, I, I saw this interview with... Uh, wait, 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 run that through again. We make it easy for people? Well, well, we make it hard for people to choose alternative paths. Oh, of course. That's, so, why, uh, that's why there's no guaranteed uh, income. Yeah, well, exactly. Rich people need minions. You take away minions by, by letting them survive without being a minion or by encouraging entrepreneurship. Or First of all, you're encouraging competition. And secondly... But I need my slaves. 
rich people don't make it on their own. They, they yeah, yeah. rich because they build on the back of millions. Right. Yeah, uh, there's this um, Bertolt Brecht, um, the, the German um, poet, author, uh, and he, he asks, you know, who built the wall of Thebes? Um, uh, which, uh, like, I guess is, I guess Egyptian, um, and uh, and his answer is, well, well, it cannot be the pharaoh, right? It cannot be the king of Egypt, um, but it was the slaves that uh, that they had in the Egyptian. You don't have to go back to Egypt. Look at the United States. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even, even today, that's the way this country was conceived, and it still runs that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. Um, but, but, yeah, so, um, yeah, so you could have literal slaves, but then I think that if you have to sell your labor to an employer, um, it is a form of um, wage slavery. And of course, of course it is. I, of course it is. Yeah, right. Um, I, I remember, remember the old comparison of a, of a uh, cubicle to a, a prison cell. Except you don't get free meals. <laughs> you don't get a roof over your head. You got to go home. You got to pay for that. Yeah, so, for that so in, in a sense... The prison cell looks actually a lot better than the, than the cubicle. How about that? But it, and it's true. So it, we're not we're not taking care of it all. It's it's a big question whether we are gradually seeing a paradigm shift. I mean, I just saw this interview with Juliet Shore. She's a sociologist, expert in labor, um, and uh, she was advocating the shorter work week. Um, and this has been an effort that. Um, you know, has been part of union struggles from the beginning of the 20th century, right? Um, oh, yeah. the late 19th century. We, well, certainly we the rid- industrial age, you know. Sure, yeah. We got rid of child labor. Um, Which was, a, that was a tough thing. To, I know why they got rid of child labor, because they were infringing on adult labor. They could get kids cheaper. So they were hiring them. And they, 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 they we can't have this. So they got, they got rid of child labor. That wasn't some kind of altruistic, oh, good-hearted thing. It was because uh, you know people were it, it was tanking the economy basically, so they had to. It's a capitalism is a self-consuming system, you know that, and and uh, you know there's many ways it can go, and that's there's a perfect example of one of the ways. Right, uh, and the next form of struggle then was to shorten the work week. Now it's very interesting that um, by I want to say. So in America, I think 40-hour work week was achieved, uh, I think, in the 1930s, 40s or so. Um, and then in the European countries, um, because, you know, they were fighting a war, so I think they were a little bit poorer than America. But but I would say by about Damn the 19- socialists made that happen. Yeah, up until Damn the 1970s, they, they got Lived to the <laughs> but, but what's so ridiculous is that we stopped. I mean, why is it that 40-hour work week is the holy grail that we're not allowed to violate. Um, it's not. It's not. M- many people work 70 hours a week. It's not the holy grail. That's just it. It's the starting point. It's like the minimum wage. It's not the, st- that's not the median. <laughs> you know? yeah. that's, so the, you, that's, you, the, that's the basic. You, you have to work 40 hours. You know? The fuck's that about? Well, it goes back to the minion thing I was talking about. You know, because we're slaves. You know, we're, we're indentured servants. That's what we are. I, I mean, you can color it any way you want. That's what we are. And it's always been, you know, oppress the, the weak uh, and exploit them and then get rich on that. That's the way every society has been. The United States is different. But the United States promised different. That's what pisses me off. It's like, don't make promises you can't keep. Right. I mean, so the, cons- yeah, the conservative sort of uh, ideology uh, is that we cannot allow people to be lazy. Uh, that is to say, to be, and, and what I mean by lazy is, is outside of the control of the bosses, of the employers. of the. Because then you're a slacker. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, and, uh, and that, that, that's a very interesting way of framing it. I mean, um, and I think a different way of framing it um, is to distinguish the concept of uh, work and a job, right? So, and it, so I think, you know, if, if we were sort of um, distinguishing these concepts, then it makes it much clearer that, you know, 
basically my objective is to get rid of jobs, but to keep working. I that's yeah. <laughs> and, and so we were better off as a agra- agra- agrarian, a, 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 you know, farming in a culture, because at least then you know we saw we reaped the harvest we sowed. You know now we don't. Now we don't. We 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 plant, we harvest, and we give it to somebody, and they give some some of it back to us. What the fuck is that about? <laughs> what bullshit is that? So <laughs> what did we buy? You know what we bought into that is the industrial era. Oh, this would be great because all these promises came along with it. Yeah, but it, I mean, so the, the the trouble right now is I, I I don't see that we got the alternative to you know trading grains and industrial agriculture because you know if, if you were sort of telling me you know put a gun to my head and uh, give me like a. A, a, a rake, and then I'm supposed to go out in the field and uh, well, okay, wait, 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 wait. I don't think I would be able to do you that. You have to, you have to, let's get on the same page first of all on that. You have to define dream, living the dream. What is the dream? What if my dream is to offend, uh, take, uh, do the field and, and, and reap the harvest and, and, you know, work in a society? You know what? I said this, I, I said this, I took an archaeology class. So you say archaeology. back to the farm. That's anthropology class. And no, I said, uh, because we were, we were studying the Bushmen and uh, they're minimalist, they're a minimalist society. And I said to my teacher, I said, you know, I thought I was like some kind of nut, uh, like from another planet or something, because I, I don't believe anything. I don't, I don't get along with anything I see set up on, on this planet. And so it's not, it's not that I'm on the wrong planet. I'm in the wrong culture. I, I don't, I shouldn't be in a capitalistic culture. I should be in a minimalist, minimalistic culture where it's a small group and they take care of each other. That's where I would thrive, but it's not permitted. That's not, that's not permitted, you know, unless I start, you know, like you know, Ted Kaczynski or something, or I start my own society or something, you know, and then it's, it's just the same thing that it gets out of hand. Anyway. I, I don't think we're meant to be in larger groups than maybe 30 at a, at a shot. I, I think that's where we work best. When we get in a large group, I don't trust any large group. First of all, I don't align with any large group. I don't belong to any large group because you know what? Large groups are scary as shit. They ultimately turn into lynch mobs. And, uh, and, and very elitist and very um, select and, and you have to be a member of that group or otherwise you're the baddie and right down to religions. So, you know, communicating with God. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think we're much better off in a smaller group, in a smaller group. And, and the, the counter to that is, well, yeah, but in a capitalist society, you get, you know, great medical and say, so what the fuck's the difference? If I die at 40 as opposed to 80, but I have a great life up until 40, I think that beats the 80-year-old guy who's like, for the last half of his life, he's like croaking. <laughs> you know? yeah, I mean, also, I, th- I think that we live much less um, healthy in today's society. Um, I, I, was, I was reading this book by Daniel Lieberman. Uh, it's Exercised. Um, and he's talking about the um, importance of sports and exercising from an evolutionary perspective. Um, And basically, um, like, think about the daily activities of a hunter-gatherer, right? They would be on their feet uh, almost all day. um, And, uh, you know, they would be, I mean, most of it is just walking, you know, when you... Yeah, yeah, how much the the Bushmen work a week? uh, 20 20 hours, average, 20 hours. Yeah, yeah. And and most of that is they go go for a hunt so they're kind of hanging out with the boys aren't they they're, yeah it's like and, going after golf and, 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 and then if you are hunting um, then there's some spurts where you have to sprint um which is what Absolutely. the human where, the human body is actually very well designed to to sprint. we're meant to run that's we you know we can we can outrun any animal on the planet that's how we how we exceeded them because we killed them all we can we, we we had rule over them because they couldn't get away from us they could run faster but we could run further and so we're meant to run we're meant to go long distance you know we just gotten old and sloppy lazy over the years but the, we're meant to you know be on our feet and running going back to the bushman they work 20 hours a week you know what they do the rest of the time they hang with their family they sit under a tree think and they're <laughs> I mean, playing music. You know, the very thing that we're, that we're talking about here that i said i could do the best of my life it's like well, fuck that makes perfect sense to me I'm dead at 40, big fucking deal. So, so now we get to live like till 70 and then we start having all these ailments and we're a mess until we die. We, we, you know, we live long, we die, we die longer, you know? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, but 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 you know, the, the when you mentioned like you know chronic illnesses and stuff like diabetes, you know, high blood pressure, etc., obesity. I mean, it, all of these sicknesses um, uh, we have uh, built up with uh, industrial lifestyle. I, I would it's say part, that it's it's, often, you, it's the symptoms of a sick society. Yeah, you you would scarcely find anybody obese um, in the hunter gatherer community, right? Because you know yeah. you'd be up on your feet all day. I mean, even if you were, you know, gorging meals like two or three days in a row, I mean, you know, there'd be periods you know, where you'd be eating very little, right? I remember reading a story. This I'm going to tell the story because it really exemplifies exactly, illustrates exactly what you said. There was this guy who was an archaeologist, uh, archaeologist, anthropologist. And he went over, uh, he was living amongst the bush people or something like that, some minimalist society. And um, for some reason, they celebrated Christmas. I guess missionaries got in there or whatever, but they were still adhered to their old ways and they'd go out hunting. And uh, so he it was getting around Christmas and they still kind of did the Christmas gift thing and all that. So he thought, you know what I'll do? And he was trying to ingratiate himself. You know what I'll do? I'll go out and I'll buy a big steer or something, bring it back to them, give it to them as a present and they'll be elated. And they got it. He did this. He got it. He was with his wife. And he went back to her lamenting because he gave it to them. They said, this is this scrawny piece of shit. You had the nerve to give it. They, and he, they berated him. And he was like, what? so he went back to her complaint. You know, like, so he, he finally had this one guy who devol- who, he could, who we could talk to, you know, and, he, and the guy finally divulged. It. He said, so don't you understand? He said, we don't do that. You know, like, oh, you're the greatest. When they go out and hunt, they don't, they don't congratulate the guy who made the kill. In fact, they insult him. And the reason they do it is to keep his ego in check. Fucking brilliant. <laughs> so, so, so I guess you are only allowed to hunt in the group, basically. That's the idea, right? Well, that's, yeah, because it's the only way to be safe. You know, you got to go out in a group. But, but the point is that, that it's a whole different structure of what's right and wrong and everything. And I think it's better because it, it really, it, it has built in uh, checks and balances better than we have um, because it, it looks at things like morals and ethics. We don't, that's the least of our concerns. Capitalism is no morals or ethics. Bottom line is morals. Bottom line is ethics. The, the bottom line of the people who own the most wealth. Well, property, the bottom line right? for everything. That's what they profess. You, know, you gotta make more money. Spend more money. You know, like, that's not the way they do it, you know. I, I, so, it, and, and so we know already that, you know, the, the capitalist ideology. I mean, it, it hits certain snags, and, oh, yeah. and as time goes on, I think we are seeing more and more of that. I mean, so let's pick them one apart. So, pandemic, for instance, right? So the idea is, so why why are we, you know, okay, we had COVID, then we are having the monkeypox now, and then. Yeah, there's a lot of like, you know, diseases out there uh, waiting in the animal world. Um, you know, they're hosting those diseases, and then we're basically waiting for them to uh, transfer the disease to humans. Um, you know, unfortunately, and 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 part of the reason why this is happening is because the human populations are expanding, right? It's because mm-hmm. it's because the world's getting smaller and we're able to go from one country to the next and that the disease spread. That's how all these plagues happen and shit. It's because they are accessibility to other areas that we didn't have way back. You have to get on a boat, you'd be dead before you got there, you know, from a disease. Yeah. Now you take it with you and you bring it into a new place and then it spreads there. Uh, going back to those Bushmen people and those minimalists, you know, it, we have capitalism uh, versus capitalism. Um, we have well, we're, we're, what about my my uh, retirement plan? My uh, you know my, uh, all these different things we have to retire. So 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 in essence, we can work for 50, 60 years, and in the last ten years, when you're fucking dying, you don't have to work, but you're dying. <laughs> all right, what they do, it, they don't work in, in in they don't they don't have like an excess. They don't go like, well, we've got to save and save. You got to save your money, That's, which is basically what they profess in capitalism. You gotta save your money. You gotta save money for retirement. Gotta, what they do, they they live they consume maybe little, two, right? maybe three days in advance with, with their meal planning, so to speak, because they don't have refrigeration. So they have to go out and kill something again, you know, and they have to have berries in the meantime or whatever, you know, forage. Um, but, and people go, well, that's insane. That, that could never work. They've been doing it for freaking thousands of years. 
the exact same way. Yeah, it works. We've been told it doesn't work. It works. It works dandy. It works much better than, than the shit we're in. Yeah. But we've been we've been duped. We've been duped. No, but, but, but see, there's there's one point about progress narrative that I like, however, which is the you know the fact that, for instance, air conditioning, right? So right now, I mean, even if it's you know 85 degrees outside, I mean, you, you don't see me break a sweat because you know. Yeah, you know why it's 85 cool degrees outside? outside right? Because we fucked up our planet. A, yeah, a minimalist well, society would not do that. Right. Okay. We do. <laughs> Right. Indians okay. So that, 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 that would be the point too. I mean, so I was going to talk about um, you know where capitalism uh, is hitting a snag, and I'd say that would be the second point, which is climate change and the warming, uh, and the fact that you know everything that we do. I mean, right now, as you know, there's inflation. People are complaining about the gas prices, but I mean, isn't it the case that the fact that we have cheap gas prices is going to encourage us to consume more? That yeah. is to say, uh, spend more gas, use up more fuel. Well, if uh, you remember the last gas crisis, that's what we did. People weren't driving. And the air quality, whoa, look, you can see these big cities now. It was all smog before. LA, look. But the economy <laughs> turns to <laughs> shit, right? Because you know, if people are buying less stuff. Right? Well, so the thing is, once jobs. the prices went down again, guess what? You couldn't see the buildings again because everybody's, because we're pigs. We're pigs. We're animals. Because, we have no, yeah, I guess we have I want no to go to this vacation. Mother Earth, none, none. We don't. They laugh at that. If you say that, people will laugh at you. What are you, some kind of fucking hippie? It's like, hey, man, it's your habitat. You're going to shit in your bed? <laughs> Come on. But people don't, you know, that's, that's, they see that as like fruity or something, or, oh, you're, what are you, Mr. New Age? It's like, no, I, I, I want to survive. Again, survival. Right. I mean, we, we, we're cutting away our ability to survive over the long term. And we're we gaining uh, a little bit of extra comforts in the short term. We have no long-term thought. We are a reactive society. We are not proactive. We're reactive at best. We have to have some kids get hit out in the corner four or five times, die, and then we put up a traffic light. That's the way our society works. That's fucked up. That's insane, in fact, in, in my eyes. And we, don't have, we don't do anything long-term. Look at our infrastructure. Ooh, that worked. Tell me how that worked out. Planning yeah, that's what, you know, <laughs> about yeah. tomorrow. God, yeah, like... wait, 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 so, you know, when, when I was visiting in Philadelphia just a few days ago, and uh, then I was coming back, um, the, 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 the SEPTA train was fine, and then I switched over in Trenton because you know I don't live right in Trenton. I mean, I have to catch another train, um, and um, and that th th that train. That was supposed to go to in the direction of New York City. Uh, that was that was first delayed and then got cancelled. And then and and then and then okay, then I had to wait a full hour for the next train. So then I waited for the next train, and then and then they said it was delayed again. Mm -hmm. Presumably, probably what happened was that in some other station, um, you know, there was some accident or something like that. Right. Right? I'm, I'm sure there's a valid reason. Okay. Yeah, some bullshit. Valid reason. Uh, but uh, but anyway, so I had to call a you know a taxi to basically get home. But um, uh, and 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 it just just tells you about the you know there's no uh, backup plan infrastructure system okay. that we have uh, in our country that um, we we live by the skin of our teeth. We we spend every cent we have. If you make if you make a hundred thousand dollars a year, you spend every cent you have. If you make 20,000 a year, you spend every cent you have. That's what our society teaches us. That's what our culture teaches us. And we're, we're duped into it. I don't. I don't make much money. I, I, but I'm able to sock away money. Why? I live simply. I don't need a whole lot. I never did. And, and I live, I'm comfortable. I'm perfectly comfortable. You know? Um, so it's 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 that we've we've been duped into thinking we need and we don't, and we and, we, and our communication as going back to the beginning has dropped. So we can't even, we don't even talk amongst each other about this because the few times we get together, it's did you see Kim Kardashian's ass? I mean that's that's what's, that's what's on our mind these days. That's that's was priority. Like the, the Amber Heard <laughs> trial, I think the 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 Heard uh, Johnny Depp trial. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that, that was probably Who the cares? biggest story recently. 
there's people that were watching that like it was their show, you know, like, oh, this is great. It's like, and it's like, are, are you in Hertz camp or are you in Depp's camp? You know, it's like, you know that. why? Because people love to watch somebody else struggle. You know, it goes back to the Coliseum. You watch somebody else struggle and you forget about your own. So watch somebody else die, you forget about you're going to. You yeah, know? That's right, yeah. And, and we're, we're, we're a fucking flawed species. I mean, we really are. Uh, you know, we're really, really backwater species. Right? And if you look at the animals and how they survive, it's simpler and it's not as sophisticated, but believe me, it makes more sense than what we do. We kill each other for fun. And for, for I, I want that piece of coal or whatever it might be, resources. The fuck? That's insane. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not I mean, even that's human. That's not even, you can't even call that human. That's like subhuman, but that's what we've become. Yeah, I mean, that, that gets us to this big topic of the, the, the Ukraine Russia war. I mean, it's been well, going that's on. maybe next, next, maybe next podcast. It's 5 30, dude. <laughs> um, well, it's it, okay. So let's, let's just, you know, discuss that very briefly because it's another thing that we're, civilization could uh, you know burn up in flames again i mean if 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 any of the political leaders you know whether the names are you know biden or putin um you know if they lose their nerve and they're going to push that red button with uh, you know it's inevitable f- it's inevitable it's, I, don't, I don't even think it's like if um i i i've, I've jokingly all truth and jest. Um, I've jokingly said, let's start a pool. What do you think will go first, the planet or the country? Think about that. And it's really hard to come up with one. I don't know, but no, I, the, no, not the planet, not because you know what? We're both on a collision course with the end. We're both, yeah. that's our trajectory. I mean, but this would be the this would be like the short term apocalypse, right? I mean. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh well, the the planet's on fire now. What the fuck else we need to? The the long term apocalypse. I I just saw the headline that um, in Italy they were going to lose fifteen percent of the crops um, when what they projected um, uh, because of a drought. I mean, they they just don't have as much rain as they as they had in the previous years. Uh, and I was reading something similar, like in France, um, w- uh, with the wine production. As you might know, the French are very proud of wine producing, um, and uh, and and they had you know a loss of that drought. Uh, and then in India, they were banning the export of wheat because uh, because they have drought issues at home. Again, we're such an uneducated and and misinformed society that I mean, right here. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna have to move our farming regions north because they they, it'll be too dry now it'll be desert that's where we're heading we're heading toward toward and i'm not kidding this is not some kind of nutty hyperbolic uh, exaggeration we're heading toward road warrior in many in many respects that's where we're headed and and i know that sounds extreme but it's not it is extreme but it's not it's not um, you know that's crazy that's crazy talking it's like you think so? Look at the stats and the way they're going. And they're getting worse and worse and worse. As, uh, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, come on. We're not doing anything to, to change it. Though our leaders aren't. Right. There was this one headline, and I mean, it, it quickly you know, disappeared from public attention again. But it was, it was like the, the measurements uh, of um, you know, current CO2 levels. I mean, it's about 421 parts per million. And, and I remember... It was about 10 years ago, about 2012, 13, uh, when they had the, f- the first headline of like, you know, 400 parts per million reached. Uh, and the in- pre-industrial average was between 260 and 280. So I, 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 th- I think the pace at which this is happening, I mean, this is absolutely catastrophic. Um, and well, you know, uh, Larry, Larry, you know this because you're an, you're an educated person. The guy with the pickup truck, the dog, and the hat and 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 uh, you know a six pack of beer. He doesn't know that shit. He doesn't know. He doesn't even know what CO two is. Is that a band? I mean, you know. Well, that, well they, they they will eventually care. I mean, if well, if the, he'll know he'll know the effects um, of it, but he won't know if it affects him eventually. He's gonna be yes. surprised. What the fuck happened? <laughs> you know, that's what he's gonna say. And it's what happened was you weren't awake. Yeah, I mean, I know I hate to use that term because it's overused, but 
you really aren't. We're, we're walking around like, we're going to be taken care of. Yeah, you're going to be taken care of, all right. Oh, you're going to be taken care of. So a, a large part of the populace, and probably, I'm not just saying the United States either. I mean, education is, is lip service for most people. Um, that the government throws out and people throw out. It's not really, if we, listen, why do we have the greatest military in the world ever? And why is our education system dropping and, and falling lower and lower and lower? Because that's not our priority. Our priority yeah. is killing people and taking what the fuck we want. We're bullies. That's our culture. Our culture is to kick ass, motherfucker. Well, I mean, I have to say, so I mean, I, I was one of the big critics of the military industrial complex. I mean, I didn't see the point of, uh, you know, wasting so much money on military spending. I mean, particularly after we came out of two devastating wars that, you know, didn't bring, you know, peace and democracy in the Middle East, but it actually made it worse. But, um, but I would, I have to say that since February, I've been very quiet about the military industrial complex because I now realize that, you know, the Ukrainian army's big basically begging uh, for American weapons and the Americans are delivering to some extent. Kennedy um, had to deal with that shit too. The, the, the point is, Larry, we're a flawed species. This is why I've, I've taken on more of an observational and you'll see a lot of astute older guys take on this kind of light and they say, oh, he's curmudgeous. No, he's facing the reality that we're fucked up as a species. We're, we're lost. We, we can't be redeemed. It's not in us to be redeemed. We, we, we're not proactive. We, we, won't, we won't actively try to do better and try to make things better. We just kind of loll along and, you know, oh, look, look, it's by the leg. You know, we, we don't think about preventative or anything. So that's the species we are. We're, we're well, destined it, it, to do. Well, you might say the whole species, but I think I mean, it always boils down to a few people, right? I mean, I always go back to this... Um, quote by, I think, Hermann Goering. He was one of the high-level Nazis uh, in, in Germany. Uh, he was put on trial in the Nuremberg um, trials. Um, and, you know, he was asked to justify his, um, you know, support for, you know, Nazi invasions in Europe. And he was saying that normal, ordinary people, ordinary Germans, uh, would never vote to go to war with Hell another no. country. You know, the way how you but the way how you get ordinary people to support the war is by simply claiming that the other side attacked you first. And anybody who speaks up against the war, most of the big wars, if not all the big wars that were started on a lie. Vietnam. WW2, well, not WW2, so as much as WW1. There's always a, a catalyst that happens. Oh, they sunk our boat. They sunk our battleship. <laughs> you know, it's like that game. Uh, it's, and then, oh, we got to kick their ass because that's we're a pugnacious, fucking uh, vengeful society. That's what we are. Uh, you know, here's, I'll, I'll cap it with this. As far as humans being a flawed species, humans can be split up into two groups, as I see it. Because you say, not all humans. You can split up into two groups. Predators and prey. We prey on ourselves. We are predators and prey. That's, that's, you're, you fall in one of those two categories and um, you can dodge one or the other for a while, but ultimately you, you're, you succumb to one of those positions. It's, it's terrible. You, how long do you think that can last? That's not, self, that's not sustaining. It can't sustain itself. Well, I mean, that's, where, that's why I say we're doomed. We, as long as we use uh, weapons that uh, you know destroy small areas, we don't. I mean, it, it, we're it, past that. We're past right. that. If we get to the point where we're actually throwing, uh, you know, nuclear weapons, um, you know, the thing that we have been fearing for, you know, since 1945, I guess. Um, we, we do what with, with nuclear weapons? Well, I mean, if, if we're throwing the nuclear weapons, uh, then then I would be very concerned about our survival. We, because you asked, you know, how long can we sustain this? And I would say as long as we're not uh, nuking each other, I think we, the point uh, is, we could survive the, this. It's going to happen. I, it's, it's like throw enough spaghetti against the wall, some of it will stick. Well, if, if you keep, like, fighting each other, you see a fight, you know, and then somebody finally in a fight, somebody gets uh, gets punched and they hit their head in the ground, they die. You go, oh, that's tragic. No, that was inevitable. They were fighting. 
It's not going to get better. That's what that's the species we are. We're predators of prey. We're like that movie Predator. Uh, we're predators of prey. We, you know, and and we we glorify the predators, which is really fucking nuts. Rich people, m- military, we glorify it. We're, we're, we're not long to be around as a species and probably good because maybe the planet will have a chance to regroup and regrow and, and you know, because it can and it's done it, but not with us here. No, nah, it's going to happen. Well, I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I think, I mean, I intellectually would accept the point uh, at which, you know, Homo sapiens goes extinct. I mean, I would just hope that it doesn't happen in my lifetime. And <laughs> like Woody Allen says, I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. And that's what you're saying. No, I, I, I feel the same way, but I've got kids and I got grandkids and they're going to have kids. I think maybe they should live. So we should stay as a play alive so long. So that's what I'm concerned about. I'm at, I'm checking out, man. You know, I'm, I'm, I have the, I have the luxury of saying this place is going to hell in a handbasket because I ain't going to be here um, <laughs> for the brunt of it. You know, so I get, I can say all sorts of shit. That's why old people do, because they, they realize, well, it's in the line. Might as well say, I don't have to fucking lie anymore. That's why. That's what old people do. That's why they say that shit, because they go, hey, I don't have to fucking lie anymore. <laughs> to that's myself right. or to you. Tough shit. Don't like it. Tough shit. That's right. Now, but but I, I I still think it's important to to resolve the issue. I mean, in in this in the Eastern European context, because um, because my my fear is that. So right now, I mean, there's military dominance in the Russian side because they have way more weapons um, systems than the Ukrainians do. Um, and let's say that, you know, after a long time, after a long battle, the the Ukrainians have to make a concession. They'd have to give up a portion of the land. Um, you know, isn't there the fear that the aggression just continues? Of course it will. That's my point. You let's say you could suddenly make peace in the Middle East and peace in Russia and Ukraine, but you know, like that, like that, that, that movie where the guy snaps his fingers and changes everything in the world. Let's say you could do that. In very short order, there'd be other shit right behind it, just as bad. Because that's what we do. We are, we are, we are, we're a species that annihilates itself. That's what we do. That's why we're predators of prey. That's what we do. And, and, and for as much as we talk about it, well, we got to come up with a solution for this. That's not the problem. That's the symptom. There's going to be more symptoms coming down the line. If you don't get rid of the problem, we're not going to get rid of the problem. So, that's so, 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 so for you, it would have, I mean, basically, you would need some divine intervention where basically. We need Gort. S- we need some, fucking Gort. Remember the day the earth stood still, that big robot? Us. We need Gort and Michael Reddy to come down and say, hey, you guys keep fucking around with each other. We're going to fry it. You choose. And that's the only way we're going to galvanize as, as, a, as a world society. The only way is if we have an outside threat. The, and, the, and the alien invasion would, would come so, and then all of a sudden uh, the, the Americans, the Russians, the Chinese, uh, everybody uh, gets on the same team now. If you, got, if you got rid of the Americans, the Russians, and the Chinese, there'd be another group ready to kill everybody too. That's our nature. That's what I'm saying. That's our nature. That's the nature of the beast. And that's why I say, that's why I, I'm, I'm at the point of going, why do I keep banging my head against the wall? This is a, a loser's battle. I mean, there's no winning this. Sorry, I'm just the messenger. Don't shoot me. <laughs> yeah, so, so I mean, so what, what's the best way to address it? I mean, um... I don't think there is one. I really don't, Larry. I mean, I wish there were. So, but- so I mean, so it's very interesting because if you look at like the Buddhists and the Stoics, who have very similar, you know, uh, philosophies. I mean, uh, uh, but it seems to be like their solution is well, is to continue living, but then checking out from, uh, you know, from society as much as possible, right? So. Um, yeah. That, that, that's why the Buddhists they're, they're sitting there with it with yeah. The, with that's the one of those. That's checking out is one of those things you can't do halfway. Meditating. Anymore. They don't do it halfway, and that's why it works for them. We can't go. Oh, I'll check out on weekends because I got job on Monday. You know, we can't. That's not checking out. That's that's taking a vacation. We don't. We we don't have the capacity nor the the wherewithal to check out, and nobody's willing to kind of say, okay, I'm going to give up everything and check out. Nobody does that. 
we've been bred different. We're cattle. So, so basically, you're, you're saying we're living uh, the spirit of Hotel California. You know, we can check out any time we like, but we can never leave. No, no. My my <laughs> verse would be: we're checking out real soon. <laughs> With, and don't think you're going to leave. <laughs> what, what song is that? What's that? What, what song is that? Um, I just made it. That, that's a parody of Hotel California's lyrics. But, uh, okay. you know, you, no, there is no checking out except to die. And, mm. and you can't leave because we're stuck on this rock. So we're doomed. Yeah. I think we're doomed as a species. Okay. So I, okay. So I, we're going to call the podcast to a close but i would ask you one thing um because you know no you're not getting that five bucks i owe you <laughs> no, 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 no 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 this is <laughs> not related at all okay. uh because you, okay for the past hour i mean we, we're giving our listeners um you know depression talk which i mean which i engage a lot in because i'm a social scientist it's and reality. Uh, always, it's a reality we, we, we study social problems so uh do, do you want to uh part with uh i don't know some happy notes or do you want to play a song i mean with one of your guitars i would love to play um uh the song i just did because uh like you said i started i did it here in my living room and you go oh that's cute this thing sounds like a professional recording i mean the the technology out there now is does have something to be said for it and um and then i took it to the finished product which sounded great by itself by the way in fact i think i like it better than the version now, which is polished, but I took it to a professional recording studio and uh, they uh, mastered it, uh, mixed it, remixed it a little bit here and there and um, it, it somewhat homogenized it, which that's what I don't like, but it sounds like a professional recording. I'd love to play that for it, but it's no way. I don't know how I could even do that over the, over this. I don't think you can. I don't know if you can, but um, I certainly don't have the technical know how to do it. Uh, so well, but, I, I, I think I think if, if you wanted to play a recording, I think the best thing would be uh, for you to give me a, a link to that. If you have it, let's say, uploaded on some platform, you know, you can send me the link to that. Well, I'll send you the song. I, I, it's, I've got it. I've got it on an email in MP3 and I have it. In, and also on that same email is a uh, is a uh, like a. Uh, I guess a file like a, a, a CD file or whatever you call that, you know. So it's it's in a format coming to you soon in a format that you could get you could access. So I, I'll get that to you as soon as we hang up. Uh, anybody watch this? Uh, tough shit. <laughs> they don't get to you. <laughs> I, I, but I I think you know you know uh, there's a song by Chic. Um, uh, everybody dance. Um, the, the one line is like music helps relieve the pain uh puts a smile on your face anytime any day um and, and, so it's morphine uh, by the way but good and I, I, but 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 that but but, that, but that, that's always that's always a line that, that's in my head i mean no listen i i I'm, I'm i'm being sarcastic at this point but no i think if there's any redeeming value in this world it is the arts um if there's anything to be said about mankind that is it can be complimentary it would be the arts because um they are at least an attempt at being proactively happy. It's about the only attempt we have. Everything else is gain, monetary gain, things. But the arts work devoid of that. And that's why that I can say that they're the only thing out there that I see that is an attempt at being happy. It, 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 it's joyful in itself because the, the aim is it's just, also... Yeah, the journey just, itself is, you know. Yeah, it's, it's about bringing happiness to the consumers of the art. That's ultimately the the the, the end goal of uh, of the arts, right? If I know there's a bomb coming, the big one's coming, I'm going to get a marshmallow on one stick, a hot dog on the other, take it out front, stick it in the ground, bring my guitar, and just start playing and wait, because there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, and, and, and so that because. I want to go with a happy smile on my face and I'll do, I'll know I'll have that about music, you know? So yeah, I think a music, a music arts in general, I think it just are only redeeming value as humans. Right. So that, 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 so that would bring us back to Friedrich Nietzsche, right? So the German philosopher, um, and, and he was saying that, you know, art is a, is an illusion, but, but it's an, but it's a worthwhile form of illusion. And actually the, 
like the pursuit of you know what we might call reality which would be the opposite of evolution um is well the thing that you know i talked about as a social scientist every day right which is war climate change uh you know the the, the destruction uh, inequality blah 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 i mean all these things <laughs> that that uh, reflect reality i mean that's all you know um i don't know it, it's it's like vain pursuit um in in the nietzschean view and he says that uh, yeah the only um pr pretty thing about human existence um uh is to pursue illusion and illusion is art essentially right um well i I don't, I don't buy that. I think myths are illusions. And we have, God knows we got plenty of myths. You know, we, we live on this. It's the only thing that can bring, that brings us together is myths, religion, government, politics, uh, celebrity, you know, whatever. It's all these myths you know, that, that we subscribe to just because oh, it must be so. So, but if art on the other hand is tangible. And I think the most tangible, the most long lasting and tangible out of all the arts is music because everything else kind of crumbles. Art, I mean, music goes on. It, it doesn't crumble. Now it might not be played anymore, but you know, it's a, there's a theory, I don't know if this is true, you might have heard this, that when you play something or you say something, it goes out and it dissipates, but it continues to go out. So, music played now might somebody might pick it up on some kind of machine or something 100 years from now you know a thousand light years away or whatever you know so i i see music as very tangible and i see art as pretty much tangible as long as it doesn't get destroyed by us but uh but i i don't think they're i don't think they're illusions at all i think um they illustrate illusion a lot of times but they don't and they use illusion as a theme but they they're not in art in itself is not an illusion it's tangible you can hold it, you can look at it, you can find joy in it. It's not an illusion at all. It's very tangible. That's by, by, by illusion, I think it's about um, it's about the human idea to some extent, right? So it, like, if, if it was like an, an object that I could you know, grab with my hand, or if it's like, you know, uh, an institution, you know, like a government or religion, as you call it, um, I, I, I think that, that, that's, that, that's what Nietzsche probably meant with tangible. And then the and, and then illusion for him is, um, yeah, th 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 things that come out of the, the human imagination, which I mean, like you, 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 you come up with the notes to play that you like to listen to, right? Um, and, uh, and, and then, of course, you don't play the notes that you don't like to listen to. I mean, but maybe somebody else will like those notes. Um, and... Um, yeah, but then this idea of like you know going back to the oldies and um, listening to that and having your mood lifted. I mean, I so I on my YouTube channel. I mean, I have created a bunch of playlists. I mean, I was listening to um, Eros Ramazzotti. He's a, I mean, if you're in the Anglosphere, it might not be familiar to you, but but he was like an Italian pop singer and in, in the eighties, nineties, two thousands, a really big one. Um, and 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 I and I re-listened to that again, um, which is like a soft ballad, um, like you know, pop song, I guess. Um, but I I I I I very much enjoyed it because because I associated with my youth because when I was because I grew up in Austria. Oh, um, that's and, this is what I was, I was saying. I was ostracized by my musical community for saying. That isn't it a shame that the only criteria, remember it's by Reynolds, the only criteria that we've come up with for music that to justify it or to to say, oh, that's great, is ah, ah, this song's great. You know, do you, you remember when this was out when, when I threw that football? I remember when I, I was in high school when I threw that, I touched it. It's it's a way for us to in delusion, uh, kind of revisit our past. Exactly. And, yeah. and reminisce. But it's a personal that, experience. Now that's delusion, <laughs> right? Um, because, because I mean, obviously, like, say, if I grew up in the in the states, I mean, then I don't think I would have ever listened to Ramazzotti. And if I heard it the first time, now I would say, "What kind of crazy bullshit is that?" But then, but no, I mean, I, I actually when I, you know, I I listened to the Ramazzotti songs, and I was like, "Yes, it puts me back in my youth days." 
Um, I, you know, I going back to the summer of '69. The, period, the only right? criteria we have for for music, my my art, is um, reminiscing. <laughs> that's that's how we judge it. No, there should be something in place to be able to actually say because you know what? Otherwise, things like rap and shit like that come sprouting up because there's no criteria. Oh, that's music. No, it doesn't even have a melody. How can it be music? Oh, no, there's a different kind of music. It's like you don't take the wheels off a car and say it's a car. Just like you don't take melody out of, out of music and say it's still music. But that many, many scream at me about that too. I think it's completely sensible to think that way. Yeah, so, so she produced the song in 2015. Um, it was called I'll Be There. Uh, and it's basically, you know, mixing a bunch of uh, old... Uh, recording instrumentals and putting it in the song together um and uh, there's this one line in the song uh where it goes you know i i don't want to live in the past but it's a nice place to visit uh and uh, th that's uh, and, and because it, it was sort of bringing it was brought out in 2015 it brings you right back into the disco era you know with the, with the bgs night fever oh. so <laughs> <the> late 70s <laughs> <laughs> That's here's, too hard for you. Here's right? my spin on that on that prophetic line you have there. Life. It's a nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's my own. Yeah, yeah. That's... And I think that's you know, when you think about it, yeah, you're right. So yeah, that's and I, I'd like to close on that because we've been on the phone on this thing for like two hours now. Okay, I think I, 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 we, this, we can this... go on, believe me, I, I enjoy this, but I you know. Uh, I have to eventually eat and sleep and stuff like that. No, you have to definitely do that. But, yeah. but, it, you, you, but it was a really good concluding note. And I think, you know, art, music, listen to that. Um, you know, like, you know, Eric Clapton, I mean, in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame speech. Viva la like, arts. Yeah, okay, it's like, you know, lo love and music is all we need. That's what he said. Well, I, 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 we've heard that a million times. Lennon said it too. I mean, Love is 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 intang is an intangible thing, but you know what? It's the only thing that makes sense in this world. That and art. So I don't think either of those things are intangible. I think they're they're the most tangible thing that's out there. It's just that we see them as intangible because we don't practice them enough. And if we did, we would feel a lot better. That's for sure. I think so, okay. and I think it would be a better place to be. And then I wouldn't be saying life, nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there. <laughs> 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 the second time you said it, it's even uh, more impactful, I should say. Okay. <laughs> Tax a wallet, doesn't it? All right, listen, I'm going to let you go. Or you okay. let me go, too. Uh, I want to say thank you very much. It's uh, been a pleasure, Larry, as always. Yeah.